and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. This is the final part of a four-part series on the Seven Years' War. If you want to get all the background and context, you should start with part one, because we're kind of just going to jump into things. As before, there is a map in the description, and remember when you're looking at the map that Prussia and Brandenburg are part of the same country, which is technically called Brandenburg-Prussia. Um, we ended last episode more or less at the end of 1760. That year was disastrous for Frederick the Great and the Kingdom of Prussia. He has effectively lost control of Saxony and he's slowly being squeezed by Austrians in the south and the Russians and, to a lesser extent, the Swedish in the north. The only thing preventing a complete Prussian collapse is the support they're getting from the British. King George II's government, under leader of the House of Commons William Pitt, is sending large annual subsidies to the Prussians. The British are also fighting their own war against the French, which includes a defense of the vital territory of Hanover in western Germany. The British and Hanoverian forces in this area are preventing the French from doing much to help their Austrian allies in Central Europe. They are in the way. At this point, the Central European powers, Prussia and Austria, are running on fumes. We talked last episode about how Frederick mixes copper into his gold coins, debasing his currency to stretch his funding to the limit. But in addition to running short on money, he is also running short on manpower. He's lost a lot of men as well as a lot of territory, so with each subsequent campaign season, he has to lower his recruiting standards a little bit more. The youngest, fittest men are either already in the army, dead, or wounded. Fortunately for Frederick, the Austrians are in a similar position. Maria Theresa had already pawned her crown jewels back in 1758, and in 1760, she has established a fund where members of the public can voluntarily contribute to the war effort. And while the Habsburg lands are more populous than Frederick's lands, remember Maria Theresa also rules Hungary, Bohemia, and several smaller statelets, there are cultural differences that make it harder for her to use all that manpower to its fullest. See, Frederick's subjects are used to the military draft. If he needs more men, he can send recruiters out to basically press gang men into service, and nobody's going to complain too much. It is expected that in wartime, young men will fight for their king. But in Austria, that's not really the tradition. Members of the nobility might well be expected to take positions as officers when called upon, but... For everyday people, service in the military is voluntary. And since Austria is in the middle of a war, they have to pay a premium to attract soldiers to service. Combine that with a shortage of money, and you can begin to understand why Maria Theresa doesn't just raise a massive army of 200,000 men and just steamroll over the Prussians. In fact... Things are so bad in 1761 that it takes the Austrians until midsummer to manage a serious offensive. Austrian troops in Silesia link up with a Russian army coming from the north. This joint army has over 100,000 men to Frederick's 55,000 or so. But Rather than show his usual aggression, Frederick does the smart thing and has his men dig in and build strong defensive positions while his cavalry run into the Russian rear, way around behind their army, and wreck their supply lines. And without food, without 
ammunition, those important things, the Russian force is forced to withdraw. But the Austrian army is still there in Silesia. It's still bigger than Frederick's, and he's stuck there maneuvering back and forth and unable to actually engage them. On October 1st, Austrian forces in Silesia take the fortress at Schwednitz, which is territory that Frederick the Great held before the war. So it's not an insignificant advance. But the main field armies never come into contact. Neither side has the resources to risk everything on a pitched battle. Now, both Frederick and the Austrians have another major army a ways to the northwest in Saxony, and he's hounding his commander in Saxony to attack the main Austrian army and roll the dice. But his commander is his younger brother Henry, who thinks Frederick is being far too aggressive. That's actually understating things a bit. There's some sibling rivalry between the two, and Henry at one point even says that Prussia would have been better off if their mother had miscarried when she was pregnant with Frederick. Regardless, Henry does not engage with the Austrians, which is probably a good thing because Frederick the Great is going to need all the troops he can muster. While the war against the Austrians has grown to a stalemate, the Russians are once again on the move. Starting in August, a large Russian force besieges the last Prussian seaport, the Baltic city of Kohlberg. Russian and Swedish warships blockade the city by sea and spend two months bombarding it. The Prussians attempt to relieve the besieged city, and some of the troops from inside break out in November and try to attack the Russian siege army in the rear but they fail. The survivors are forced to retreat south to Berlin, and on December 16, 1761, Kohlberg's garrison surrenders to the Russians. The fall of Kohlberg is a big deal. As I said, this is Prussia's last major port, and by cutting it off, the Russians isolate Prussia from her British allies. It's going to be much harder to get help in 1762, and worse yet from the Prussian perspective, that help is going to be diminished. See, William Pitt has had some successes in 1761. He's worked with Geoffrey Amherst to deploy troops from New York to the French Caribbean colony of Dominica. The invasion is successful, dealing another blow to French overseas colonial interests. More impressively, a British amphibious assault successfully captures Belle Isle, a major island off the French coast, marking the first occupation of French European territory by hostile forces during the Seven Years' War. But the war is growing less and less popular in Britain, and King George II has died, leaving the throne to his son George III, who is less enthusiastic about the war than his father was. And William Pitt overplays his hand. In his book, Frederick the Great, A Military History, American historian Dennis Showalter writes, quote, Diplomatically as well as militarily, the final weeks of 1761 brought only misfortune to Prussia and its king. Despite the failure of the French campaign in Germany... Spain, in August, concluded a treaty with France that amounted to an alliance against England. Pitt responded by arguing for a declaration of war. Denied by a parliament weary to death of war without end, he resigned. His successor was the Earl of Bute, no pacifist, but a peace-minded statesman. He began his term in office by rethinking England's relationship with Prussia. In December, Bute had informed Frederick that instead of asking Parliament to renew the subsidy treaty, he would request a specific grant at an opportune time, preferably between the 12th of Never and the 31st of June. 
Butte's next step was to urge Frederick to seek terms with Austria, cutting his strategic coat to his military cloth even if that involved significant territorial concessions. Neither Britain's pockets nor its patience, Butte declared in effect, were bottomless. For Frederick, this represented a final catastrophe. With the port of Kohlberg in Russian hands, the logistics of their next year's campaign would be simpler than ever before. Forces already strong could be enlarged almost at will, with supplies and reinforcements transported by sea across a Baltic that from Prussia's perspective was now a Russian lake. The administrative and economic integration of Prussia's occupied eastern territories into the Tsarist Empire was also likely to be significantly facilitated by the opening of the coast to Russian and Swedish merchantmen and traders. Prussia's situation seemed no more promising in the south. With Schwednitz and Austrian hands, the Habsburg army was able to establish most of its winter camps on the Prussian side of the Silesian border, with corresponding impact on Frederick's ability to tap that province's resources for the coming campaign. Russian troops, cantoned almost on the border of Brandenburg, rendered chances of compensating by purchasing grain and remounts in Poland significantly limited. From a more general perspective, Frederick could not escape the fact that the core of his state, the provinces of Brandenburg and Pomerania, now lay wide open to raid and invasion on a regular basis. As has previously been suggested in these pages, the social contract between Frederick and his people involved the exchange of service for protection. Even if the enemy should be unable to overrun what remained of the Prussian kingdom, razzias and sorties could do much to make the state ungovernable. End quote. At this point, Frederick the Great is considering abdicating the throne. Maria Theresa is already making plans for the reintegration of Silesia into her realm. It looks like a done deal. Prussia is finally beaten down, has no real friends, and the Austrians and the Swedish and the Russians are going to divide it up amongst themselves. Maybe if Frederick doesn't get himself killed in some last suicidal battle, they'll let him keep a nice little estate near Berlin. If you're a military analyst in late 1761, you can take this to the bank. You would bet your children's lives on it. But that would be a bad bet. People often ask me why I have an obsession with history, and there are many reasons, but... One of the main reasons is a cliché. Truth is stranger than fiction. See, fiction, if it's going to be any good, requires suspension of disbelief. The author and the reader have a tacit agreement that the author will tell as believable a lie as possible, and in exchange the reader will temporarily believe the lie while they're engaging with the story. So, when you're an author, you have to follow certain rules. The story needs to be internally consistent. People who watch Game of Thrones, for example, will believe willingly in dragons and ice zombies, but they will get very upset when the characters in Season 7 can cross Westeros in five minutes when it took them half of Season 1 to make the same trip. And most importantly... In fiction, your protagonist has to earn their victories. It's okay if they suffer random bad luck. That builds tension and moves the story along. But your hero can't win because the villain randomly drops dead from a stroke. It feels cheap and the audience won't accept it. All of this to say that if you were to write the story of Frederick the Great as fiction with Frederick as the protagonist, no one would publish it. Because on January 5th, 1762, history breaks all the rules of good fiction and drops a big deus ex machina on us. Elizabeth Petrovna, the Russian empress, dies of a stroke. 
And this event, which comes to be known as the second miracle of the House of Brandenburg, changes everything. As you may recall, Elizabeth Petrovna wasn't exactly Frederick the Great's biggest fan. But when she dies, she leaves Russia in the hands of her nephew, Peter III, who is a big fan of the Prussians. He actually dreams of rebuilding the Russian army on the Prussian model. Almost immediately upon taking the throne, he opens negotiations with Frederick. Peter III gets a bad rap from a lot of sources, particularly older sources. Here's a good example, a description of him from the 1911 Encyclopedia Britannica. Quote, Nature had made him mean, the smallpox had made him hideous, and his degraded habits made him loathsome. And Peter had all the sentiments of the worst kind of a small German prince of the time. He had the conviction that his princeship entitled him to disregard decency in the feelings of others. He planned brutal practical jokes in which blows had always a share. His most manly taste did not rise above the kind of military interest which has been defined as a corporal's mania. The passion for uniforms, pipe clay, buttons, the tricks of parade and the froth of discipline. He detested the Russians and surrounded himself with Holsteiners. End quote. But here's the thing. Peter III would only be czar for about six months before being assassinated and overthrown by his wife, who would become Catherine the Great. And Catherine would have 34 years as empress to spread all kinds of propaganda about Peter to justify overthrowing him. Dennis Showalter is probably fairer to Peter III when he writes, quote, Russian nationalist historians have made much, perhaps too much, of Peter's shortcomings as a man and an emperor. He was certainly susceptible to Frederick's flattery. When awarded the Order of the Black Eagle and made an honorary general in the Prussian army, Peter's sycophantic responses disgusted even the Prussians in his entourage who benefited from the Tsar's obsession. Peter, however, was at least something more than a weak-minded man jealous of his spouse. His prusophilia and his status as the heir apparent had made him the symbol, if not quite the leader, of the faction at court that had from the beginning criticized war with Prussia as ultimately inimical to Russia's interests. Prussia, these men argued, represented nothing like a serious long-term threat to Russian security. Had Russia kept the peace in 1756, Frederick might at worst have been in a position to challenge directly Russian influence in Kurland. Hardly a major problem. As for Poland, any Prussian gains on the western borders of that ramshackle state could easily be balanced by Russian annexations in the Polis East and Russian influence in Warsaw, the latter an advantage beyond the annexation of East Prussia. Reality in the latter case was certain to be a nightmare, generating a permanent anti-Russian coalition of German states under Prussian or Austrian leadership, perhaps even encouraging these enemies to make common cause against a new, greater threat from the East. To speak, in short, of Peter's search for peace with Frederick as a great betrayal is defensible only in the context of equating 18th century Prussia with Wilhelmine or Hitlerian Germany as a permanent objective threat to the rest of Europe. By 1762, it was arguable, if not quite self-evident, that Prussia's only real challenge was to Austria. Whatever might have been strategically defensible, moreover, in Elizabeth's original intention to reduce Prussia to the status of a middle-ranking German power, events since 1756 strongly suggested that such a policy was no longer feasible. Prussia might and could be broken. But a peace concluded on that basis was likely in turn to aggrandize Austria's German position to a degree, making it a more than uncomfortable neighbor for Russia. End quote. What Showalter is saying is that, from the Russian perspective, the war against Prussia doesn't make much sense to begin with. 
take a bunch of land in Germany, and it's going to cause trouble with whoever is dominant there, Austria or Prussia. And if you knock down Prussia, you set up Austria to totally dominate Germany and maybe become so strong that it's a threat to Russia. There's no winning either of those scenarios. Things get a little bit spicy, though. See, the new British Prime Minister, Butte, sends a secret message to Peter asking him to stay in the war until Prussia surrenders. This is an odd thing to do for a country that's supposed to be Frederick's ally, but Butte's government thinks it's inevitable that Prussia is going to have to give up some territory, and the thinking is that the sooner Frederick can be brought to make some concessions, the sooner the war will be over. But instead of going along with this, or even ignoring Butte's message, Peter sends a copy of it to Frederick. And at the same time, the British government have also been reaching out to the Austrians, offering to make a separate peace on the premise that Britain would push to have some of Frederick's Silesian territory returned to them during peace negotiations. The Austrians would refuse. Both Maria Theresa and her foreign minister Konitz distrust the British. But the Prussian ambassador in London finds out about this, and he sends a message to Frederick. Frederick gets both of these messages, these proofs of British betrayal, on the same day, March 23rd. Things move quickly from there. On May 15, 1762, Prussia and Russia formally sign a peace treaty. A week later, with Peter III's mediation, Prussia and Sweden make peace. This is Sweden's only logical choice. The Swedish people remain lukewarm about the war and will only support limited military funding. With the Russians out of the war, the logical thing to do is to shake hands and go home, and that's what they do. Both of these peace treaties are big deals. With the Russian peace treaty, not only does Frederick no longer have to worry about the Russian army at his back, but he instantly gets back access to East Prussia and the port city of Kohlberg and other territories that the Russians had been holding. And within days, he's sending officers out to those areas to recruit new troops. With the Swedish peace treaty, the threat to Prussia's north is entirely eliminated. Now, Frederick has thousands of troops in that area. These are guys who, before the war, had really been second echelon type troops, and their job has just been to keep the Swedes bottled up. But with the sagging troop standards all around Prussia, these second echelon guys suddenly look like some of Frederick's best units. And... With the Swedish gone, those troops can be brought south to help deal with the Austrians. On June 1st, Peter III will go a step further and formally join the Prussians. So not only are the Austrians suddenly without their Russian allies, but 20,000 Russian troops are now marching alongside Fredericks. This state of affairs will be short-lived, on July 9th, Peter will be overthrown by his wife, and the new empress, Catherine the Great, will pull Russia out of the war entirely. Even so, the tables have turned dramatically in Central Europe. If Maria Theresa is going to win, she's going to need some help from her French allies. As it turns out, those French allies have been making some moves to expand the war. Since mid-1761, the French and Spanish foreign ministers have been coming to an agreement on something called the Pact de Famille, or Family Alliance. Both Louis XV and Spanish King Charles III are members of the House of Bourbon, and the French have played on family sympathies to bring the Spanish into the war. They had signed a secret agreement in August of 1761, but 
The Spanish had taken no official action until December, when they placed an embargo on British trade and seized all British-owned goods in the country. Now, Spain still had not declared war on Britain at this point, but they had promised the French that they would declare war in May of 1762 if no peace deal had yet been worked out. Unfortunately for them, the British intercepted a copy of this agreement, and in response, Britain preemptively declared war on Spain on January 4, 1762. This is the main reason Prime Minister Bute wants peace in Central Europe so badly. Britain is at war with yet another country, and supporting the Prussians is prohibitively expensive. As it turns out, the British need not have worried so much. Despite the French Navy still having many ships at sea, the Royal Navy is still able to turn on Spanish shipping in a hurry. The government is quick to act against Spain's colonial possessions. Within days of the declaration of war, orders are dispatched to India for an invasion of the Philippines. On October 6, 1762, the city of Manila surrenders to the 10,000-man British invasion force. The summer of 1762 also sees the British take Cuba from the Spanish and the Caribbean island of Martinique from the French. At Havana, they catch the Spanish fleet completely off guard and blow the masts off their ships before they're even able to leave the harbor. And much of this is possible because the Spanish weren't planning on opening hostilities until May, so these preemptive strikes early on catch them unprepared. Now, these are major losses for the French and Spanish in the colonial arena, but the Spanish at least have some successes. A British invasion of Panama fails due to a combination of tropical disease and determined Spanish defenders. And in South America, Spanish colonists win some minor victories over Portuguese colonists, but nothing major. Yes, you heard me correctly. Portugal also gets involved in this war. See, much like Spain had been a French ally but remained neutral through most of the war, Portugal had been a British ally but has also remained on the sidelines. See, the Portuguese-British alliance is purely defensive, and if you'll recall, way back in 1756... Britain was the one to declare war on France. This is an offensive war, so nothing has triggered the alliance. At least not until the French and Spanish decide to launch a joint invasion of Portugal. This is more driven by French demands than Spanish. If you remember from last episode, some French ships had tried to flee from a British fleet through Portuguese waters, and that, that fleet had come under neutral Portuguese fire. Well, that has made the French angry with the Portuguese, and that's going to be their pretext for declaring war. The Spanish are less enthusiastic about attacking Portugal. The border between Spain and Portugal is mountainous and difficult to move an army across. The Spanish want to avoid bringing Portugal into the war and instead attack the British in Gibraltar, which, while still mountainous, is a tad more manageable than invading all of Portugal. But the French convince the Spanish to try anyway. The idea is to move into the north of Portugal with overwhelming force, establish a base of supply, requisition food from the surrounding areas, and force the British to divert thousands or tens of thousands of troops to help Portugal. The idea is that this will weaken British forces in Hanover enough to allow the French to make a breakthrough there. During the Napoleonic Wars, Napoleon would complain about his Spanish ulcer. 
meaning the war in Spain that just went on and on, wasting so many of France's best troops without leading to any real resolution. Well, in the Seven Years' War, the French and Spanish are about to have a Portuguese ulcer to deal with. And just like with Napoleon's armies, this ulcer will create a ton of heartburn for the French side. The first attempted invasion of Portugal begins on May 5, 1762. This invasion is led by a guy named Nicolas de Carvajal de Lancaster, Marquis of Saria, who we will just call the Marquis of Saria. He's an old-school aristocrat who seems to have gotten the job mostly because he's politically connected. The Spanish force numbers only 22,000, which is a relatively small invasion force by European standards of the time, but the Portuguese army is also fairly small. Portugal is still an empire at this time, but it's a declining empire, and most of its power is at sea. The Marquis of Soria chooses to invade through the province of Trasos Montes, which is a flat, plateau-like region in northeastern Portugal. His plan is to seize the province in one fell swoop, leading to the collapse of the Portuguese government. To this end, Spanish propaganda portrays the invasion as a war of liberation. Portugal is under the thumb of the aggressive British Empire, a vassal in all but name, and the Spanish army is here to liberate our Iberian brothers. That sort of thing. Saria even sends men into Portugal in late April to hang up flyers telling the people not to be afraid, that this isn't a war against Portugal or the Portuguese people, only against the British and their puppets in the Portuguese government. At first, this approach seems to work. Portugal at the time is woefully unprepared for an invasion, even though they know it's been coming. The Portuguese government has been frantically calling for British aid and military advisors and is even trying to get a British general to lead their army. Their immediate hopes in the short term rely on holding the fortress at Miranda do Douro, which defends a crucial river junction that controls access to the rest of the province. This is a large, stout fortress with four large towers overlooking the countryside, so the Spanish settle in for what looks to be a long siege. But within three days, a lucky cannon shot lands right in the Portuguese powder magazine, igniting 500 barrels of gunpowder. The explosion is so powerful that it knocks down all four towers of the fortress and kills 400 people in the surrounding town, which is a third of the civilian population. I wasn't able to find numbers on Portuguese military losses, but I'm going to go with most of the garrison. With Miranda do Douro in their hands, the Spanish army under the Marquis of Saria is able to conquer the rest of the province of Trasos Montes by the end of May. But Miranda do Douro also marks the end of the plateau. And from there on out, the terrain begins to get rougher. At first, relations with the locals are good. The propaganda campaign seems to have paid off, and the Marquis of Saria pays double the going rate for supplies. But soon he runs out of money. The political collapse Spanish war planners had been counting on has not materialized. Now his men have no supplies, and they begin raiding for food, which makes the Portuguese locals angry. A contemporary British account reads, quote, The Spaniards, instead of advancing boldly to face their enemies, content themselves with dispatching flying parties from their camp who commit unheard-of barbarities among the small villages, robbing and murdering the inhabitants, setting fire to their crops, 
and not even sparing the sacred furniture belonging to their chapels. End quote. The Portuguese are also boosted by a patriotic wave. The governor of Trasos Montes calls on the people to fight a guerrilla war, and Spanish raiders are often ambushed by armed bands of Portuguese farmers. This idea of a political collapse has been a massive miscalculation on the Franco-Spanish side, because the Portuguese government is actually very popular. The prime minister at the time, Sebastião José de Carvalho e Melo, first Marquis of Pombal, is another guy with a really long name, and we'll just call him the Marquis of Pombal. But besides having a long name, he is also a liberal reformer and a student of the Enlightenment. In addition to helping the country recover from the disastrous Lisbon earthquake of 1755, He's established a secular school system, including trade schools funded by a progressive tax system. He's also established a system of guilds and charters to industrialize Portugal's economy, which until very recently had been entirely agrarian. The Portuguese people have their share of domestic issues like any country, but the Marquis of Pombal's government enjoys broad public support. The Portuguese people don't see themselves as being under the British thumb, and they certainly have no interest in living under the Spanish thumb. And if we're being honest, the Spanish army has some serious morale problems. Many of the troops are foreign mercenaries. There are a lot of Scots and Irish in this invasion. And these guys work fine as home guard troops or second echelon type guys, but once they get marched into an invasion as frontline troops, so to speak, well, the desertions start almost immediately. The Marquis of Saria's army slowly starts to melt away. And they're suffering from disease, too, which doesn't help. By some accounts, more than 4,000 Spanish soldiers are sick by the end of May. Even so, considering the state of the opposition, they ought to be advancing. Here's what Charles O'Hara, a British military advisor, has to say about the local Portuguese troops, writing in a letter to his father, quote, I wish your lordship could see my forces. Nothing could be half so ridiculous. Such an assemblage of old firelocks without locks, Musty swords with daggers, pikes, halberds, scythes, etc. Such as they are, the enemies have endeavored hitherto in vain to pass. End quote. In other words, the Portuguese army is in no condition to fight, and the Spanish still can't do anything because their army is in such poor condition. It's like watching a football game between two peewee teams that are starting their backup quarterbacks. And for the most part, this is due to the Marquis of Saria's hesitancy. He doesn't provoke any major battles after taking the fortress city of Miranda do Douro, and he's hoping that his army's mere presence will bring Portugal to its knees. Now, he does dispatch a force of around 5,000 men in a probing attack against the major port city of Porto. But Charles O'Hara is able to lead a defense with 600 lightly armed peasants. No matter how you cut it, that speaks very poorly of Spanish military performance, but one does wonder if the Marquis of Saria had brought all of his troops in at once, would those 600 peasants really have been able to hold all of them? Instead, the Spanish try two more attacks with portions of their army, taking different routes towards Porto, and both of these armies are also defeated by peasant militias. While this is going on, more guerrillas are occupying mountain passes and other choke points the Spanish have to travel through picking off guys whenever they can and 
generally making things miserable for the Spanish. By the end of June, the Marquis of Saria's army is forced to withdraw. The Spanish army has been driven off, but that's not the end of the Spanish invasion. It's just the end of the Marquis of Saria. See, there is a second Franco-Spanish army invading nearby, and this army has had some success, taking the strategic border fortress of Almeida in late August. In an elaborate, face-saving bit of kabuki theater, Spanish King Charles III makes the Marquis of Saria a member of the Order of the Golden Fleece, one of Spain's most prestigious chivalric orders. This award is supposedly for the seizure of Almeida, which he had nothing to do with, but it's really more of a lifetime achievement award. The Marquis of Saria then retires, and he is replaced by Pedro Pablo Abarca de Bolea y Jiménez de Urea, the Count of Aranda, who we will just call the Count of Aranda. And he's the guy who actually took the fortress at Almeida. The Count of Aranda ditches the old invasion plan and comes up with a new one. Instead of invading Portugal through the northeast, he's going to use Almeida as a supply base and make a drive for the capital city of Lisbon. This is a huge threat to the Portuguese. The Spanish army numbers 30,000 strong, with around 12,000 French soldiers to bring the total to around 42,000. Meanwhile, the Portuguese have around 17,000 soldiers. Some sources say as little as 7,000, with around 7,000 British troops. The Portuguese government is even making plans to transport the royal family to Brazil if the capital falls, to continue the war from there. All is not doom and gloom. By now, the Portuguese have obtained the services of Wilhelm von der Lippe, a minor German prince, to act as their commander-in-chief. The British have also sent John Campbell, the Earl of Luton, who you may remember from the North American theater of the war, to act as von der Lippe's second-in-command. I don't want to go into excruciating detail about the war in Iberia, because it's really a sideshow to the other theaters of operation. But I do want to summarize, because it's the last time the Franco-Spanish-Austrian alliance shows any signs of life. And this campaign is a big part of what ultimately brings France around to a peace agreement. Perhaps the best summary I've found comes from the American historian and Nobel Prize winner Lawrence H. Gibson in his book, The British Empire Before the American Revolution, The Great War for the Empire, The Culmination, 1760 to 1763. Gibson writes of the Count of Aranda's invasion, quote, Now moving to both the South and the West, he soon had the territory of Castelbranco in his grip, and then advanced in order to cut the Tagus off at Villa Velha. But Aranda soon ran into difficulties. Lower down the river, von der Lippe had securely entrenched himself at Abrantes with a strong force of British and Portuguese. Furthermore, while the Spaniards and French were besieging Almeida, he had detached Brigadier General John Burgoyne against the Spanish supply town of Valencia de Alcantara, lying close to the border and on the upper Tagus. Moving rapidly across the mountains, with a force far below his expectations and requirements, in five days, Burgoyne struck the town without warning on August 27th, captured a general and a considerable body of officers, and cut to pieces a regiment before retiring to resume his watch on the middle course of the Tagus. Early in October, the energetic brigadier gave the Spaniards another surprise when he ordered a force under Colonel Charles Lee, also later to participate in the War for American Independence, to cross the river and strike Villa Velha, 
It surprised and put to rout a Spanish force there and destroyed magazines. Burgoyne thereupon settled down at Niza to watch the Spaniards and especially to prevent any movement of the enemy to the south of the Tagus, where, in the level country, the Spanish cavalry could have been used to deadly effect. Lip, meanwhile, had concentrated 15,000 British and Portuguese troops at Abrantes, called the Pass to Lisbon. With the coming of the autumnal rains, and with his army not only ravaged by disease and other ills, but greatly reduced as the result of desertions, General Aranda found it impossible to remain in the desolate mountainous country that he had gained, and to which he was confined. He therefore began to withdraw his half-starved, half-naked troops to Spain, and so precipitously as to leave, according to reports, his sick and incapacitated behind. Although he thereupon took post at Albuquerque, just over the border, and gave out reports he would return the following spring, the Portuguese war had really ended, and as ingloriously as it had auspiciously begun. End quote. It's hard to understate how disastrous this invasion is for the Franco-Spanish coalition. Portuguese military losses are in the hundreds. The British lose a little over 800 men, but despite Burgoyne's aggressive series of attacks, only 14 of those men are lost in combat. Burgoyne's leadership in this campaign, incidentally, is what establishes his reputation and gains him command of a British army during the American War of Independence. By comparison to these few hundreds of losses, more than 12,000 Spaniards are dead, most of them to disease, with similar numbers of deserters and prisoners not to mention all the artillery and other loot left behind during retreats. And beyond being a major loss, this is a national embarrassment. Spain is way bigger and more populous than Portugal. They should win this. And worse, this is an own goal. The Spanish didn't want to invade Portugal. Their top generals advised against it. They wanted to attack Gibraltar, which probably would have been successful. Instead, they went along with the French plan, and it's gone exactly as their own military leaders predicted. So much for the war in Iberia. By now, France, Britain, Spain, and Portugal are all deeply engaged in serious peace negotiations to end the war. But in Central Europe, Maria Theresa's Austria and Frederick the Great's Prussia are going to give each other one final push to try and settle things. Starting in August of 1762, Frederick the Great takes part in the last battle of the war that he personally participates in, the Siege of Schwednitz. If you'll recall, Schwednitz is the fortress in Prussian Silesia that had fallen to the Austrians the year before. Frederick manages to surround the fortress with a force of 25,000 men, badly outnumbering the 10,000 Austrian defenders. And by surrounding the fortress, he separates it from the main Austrian field army, which is still under the command of Leopold von Dahn, one of the most cautious generals I've ever read about. Von Dahn sends a force to try to relieve Schwednitz, but it's a small detachment of his entire army and Frederick is able to beat off the attack. At that point, the defenders offer to surrender, but Frederick refuses to allow them to retreat with honors, which would mean they get to march away with their weapons. He insists that they agree to be taken prisoner, which they refuse. So the siege drags on into September, when von Dahn sends another relief effort that the Prussians also drive off. On October 8th, a Prussian siege tunnel reaches the spot directly under Schwednitz's powder supplies, and the Prussian engineers set off a bomb. 
This bomb ignites the whole powder magazine, killing many men, seriously damaging the defenses, and, oh yeah, destroying the gunpowder they need to defend themselves. So, on October 9, 1762, the surviving 9,000 Austrian defenders surrender Schwiednitz to the Prussians, and Frederick is once again in control of basically the same territory he controlled at the outset of the war. Twenty days later, Frederick's brother Henry defeats another Austrian army at the Battle of Freiburg. This battle is in Saxony, to the west of where Frederick is, and when the Prussians win, it drives the Austrians back almost all the way to Dresden, the capital of Saxony. If you'll remember from a few episodes ago, Frederick started the war with a decapitation strike against Dresden to knock the Saxons out of the war. Well, here we are six years later, and once again Frederick's army stands at the outskirts of Dresden. And while Prussia and Austria are both exhausted, Austria is now down to allies, Russia and Sweden. At this point, Maria Theresa might still be able to tap her reserves and destroy Frederick, or at least push back his armies and force him to give back a little bit of Silesia. She still has far greater resources, including her lands in Bohemia and Hungary. But the final blow has already been struck. Beginning in May 1762, the Ottomans have begun raiding in Hungary. The Ottoman Empire is Austria's greatest historical foe, and while it's a declining power at the time, Austria and France have been lobbying to keep the Ottomans out of the war as hard as Frederick the Great has been trying to drag them into the war. There's been diplomacy going on in the background this whole time, and the Ottomans, wisely, have decided to focus on internal reforms rather than get sucked into a general European war. But with the Austrians looking this weak, Hungary is just too juicy a target not to raid. At this point, what's Maria Theresa going to do about it? Her armies are barely holding up against Prussia, a much smaller power than the mighty Ottoman Empire. In their book, The Story of Civilization, Volume 10, Rousseau and Revolution, American historians Will and Ariel Durant write, quote, Maria Theresa resigned herself to peace with her most hated foe. All her major allies had abandoned her, and a hundred thousand Turks were marching into Hungary. She sent an envoy to Frederick, proposing truce. He accepted, and at Hubertsburg, near Leipzig, February 5th through 15th, 1763, Prussia, Austria, Saxony, and the German princes signed the treaty that ended the Seven Years' War. After all the shedding of blood, ducats, rubles, tollers, kronen, francs, and pounds, the status quo antebellum was restored on the continent. Frederick kept Silesia and Glatz, Vessel and Gelderland. He evacuated Saxony and promised to support the candidacy of Maria Theresa's son Joseph as king of the Romans and therefore emperor-to-be. At the final signing, Frederick's aides congratulated him on the happiest day of your life. He replied that the happiest day of his life would be the last one. What were the results of this war? To Austria the permanent loss of Silesia, and a war debt of a hundred million accused. The prestige of the Austrian rulers as traditional holders of the imperial title was ended. Frederick dealt with Maria Theresa as ruler of an Austro-Hungarian rather than a Holy Roman Empire. The German princes of the empire were now left to their resources and would soon submit to the Prussian hegemony in the Reich. The Habsburg power declined, the Hohenzollern power rose. The road was open for Bismarck. Patriotism and nationalism began to think in terms of Germany instead of each proudly separate state. German literature was stimulated to Sturm und Drang and mounted to Goethe and Schiller. Sweden lost 25,000 men and gained nothing but debts, 
Russia lost 120,000 men to battle, hardship, and disease, but would soon reproduce them. She had opened a new era in her modern history by marching into the West. The partition of Poland was now inevitable. For France, the result was enormous losses in colonies and commerce, and a near bankruptcy that moved her another step toward collapse. For England, the results were greater than even her leaders realized. Control of the seas, control of the colonial world, the establishment of a great empire, the beginning of 182 years of ascendancy in the world. For Prussia, the results were territorial devastation, 13,000 homes in ruins, a hundred towns and villages burned to the ground, thousands of families uprooted, 180,000 Prussians, by Frederick's estimate, had died in battle, camp, or captivity. Even more had died through lack of medicine or food. In some districts, only women and old men were left to till the fields. Out of a population of 4.5 million in 1756, only 4 million remained in 1763. Frederick was now the hero of all Germany, except Saxony. He entered Berlin in triumph after an absence of six years. The city, though destitute, with every family in mourning, blazed with illuminations to welcome him and acclaimed him as its savior. The iron spirit of the old warrior was moved. Long live my dear people, he cried. Long live my children. He was capable of humility. In his hour of adulation, he did not forget the many mistakes he had made as a general. He, the greatest of modern generals, excepting Napoleon. And he could still see the thousands of Prussian youths whose bloody deaths had paid for Silesia. He himself had paid. He was now prematurely old at fifty-one. His back was bent, his face and figure lean and drawn, his teeth lost, his hair white on one side of his head, his bowels racked with colic, diarrhea, and hemorrhoids. He remarked that now his proper place was in a home for elderly invalids. He lived twenty-three years more and tried to redeem his sins with peaceful and orderly government. Politically, the main results of the Seven Years' War were the rise of the British Empire and the emergence of Prussia as a first-class power. Economically, the chief result was an advance toward industrial capitalism. Those gargantuan armies were glorious markets for the mass consumption of mass-produced goods. What client could be more desirable than one that promised to destroy the purchased goods at the earliest opportunity and order more? Morally, the war made for pessimism, cynicism, and moral disorder. Life was cheap, death was imminent, suffering was the order of the day. Pillage was permissible. Pleasure was to be seized wherever it could for a moment be found. But for this campaign, said Grimm in Westphalia, 1757, I should never have conceived how far the horrors of poverty and the injustice of man can be carried. And they had only begun. The suffering helped, as well as hindered, religion. If a minority was turned to atheism by the stark reality of evil, the majority was moved to piety by the need to believe in the ultimate triumph of the good. A reaction to religion would soon come in France, England, and Germany. Protestantism in Germany was saved from destruction. Probably, if Frederick had lost, Prussia would have experienced, like Bohemia after 1620, a compulsory restoration of Catholic faith and power. End quote. Now, there is a lot to unpack here. We've spent four episodes mostly talking about a war. But the real impact of a war is in the peace agreement. That's where the big historical changes happen. The impact also includes cultural and demographic effects. And a lot of what happens here is really earth-shattering, and I want to take some time to go into it. 
To begin with, there are a few peace treaties that end the war because different powers are involved in different hostilities. The most famous is the Treaty of Paris, signed on February 10, 1763, between France, Britain, Spain, and Portugal. So if I slip up and say that something or other happened because of the Treaty of Paris, even though it happened under one of the other treaties, take it easy on me. This isn't an international law podcast, and outside of that field, the exact treaty that had any given result isn't really that important. In Europe, I can sum things up in two words. Nothing happened. Following the Seven Years' War, there are zero territorial exchanges on the European continent. Zip. Nada. But only looking at territorial exchanges would be a myopic approach to a war that lasted seven years and claimed hundreds of thousands of lives. Millions, depending on how you count it. Most importantly... The Seven Years' War has blown up the old alliance system in Europe. No longer are Britain and Austria aligned against the French and the Prussians. After so much violence, there are too many raw feelings between the old allies. Instead, the new system takes over, with France and Austria allied against Prussia and Britain. Like I said, the blow-up of the old alliance system in Europe is important, but I think a lot of people put an inordinate focus on the formation of this new alliance system, and, and I think that's kind of unimportant. That's because subsequent events over the next couple of decades, the American and French revolutions, will make this new temporary alliance system irrelevant. Even so, it's worth noting that, like any brand new system, this one is a bit unstable. Beyond that, Spain has suffered a serious loss of prestige. As we'll see, Spain actually doesn't make out badly in the colonial territorial sense of things, but what should have been a lopsided war against Portugal is embarrassing. And contributes to the decline in the international reputation of the Spanish Empire. By the same token, Prussia has been legitimized. Following the end of the war of the Austrian succession, an unbiased analyst could have come to the conclusion that Frederick the Great got lucky. Maria Theresa and the Habsburg Empire were assaulted from all sides and Frederick was like the little shark that got into a freeing frenzy and took a bite out of a big whale. But after beating the Austrians a second time, this time in a long, sustained war, Frederick's young kingdom of Prussia has made itself into a regional power. This is huge, especially for the history of nationalism, which is the subject of this season of the show, Without Prussia, you don't get Germany. Without Germany, you don't get some of the darker manifestations of nationalism we'll see later on in the 20th century. Well, this is it. The birthplace of Germany. As Will and Ariel Durant point out, Austria also comes out a winner. Following the War of the Austrian Succession, Maria Theresa's administration had scrambled to reform the military and work out an alliance with France that would serve them better than the previous alliance with Britain. Now, look at the results of the two wars. During the War of the Austrian Succession, Maria Theresa was forced to cede territory. Following the Seven Years' War, her empire is intact. So, despite the war's cost, she's also able to take a victory lap. As for France and Britain, well, the implications of the war for them are entirely in the colonial sphere. Before I talk about that, I want to talk about Frederick the Great and Maria Theresa. They are the biggest players in this drama that we've played out not just over the last four episodes, but really since we started talking about the War of the Austrian Succession. 
both of them will live on for many years and won't really factor into anything I cover going forward in this season, and it would be unfair to leave you with an image only of what they did in wartime, because these are two of my favorite historical figures, and both of them go on to become national heroes. In the years following the war, Frederick the Great will continue to expand Prussia's territory, and along with it, his sources of income, industry, and manpower. In 1764, he signs an alliance with Russia. This shifts the balance of power in Eastern Europe against Austria. A few years later, in 1768, the Russians and the Ottomans go to war. The Russians absolutely steamroll the Ottomans and push them back all the way into the Balkans by the early 1770s. This puts Russian troops on the border of the Austrian Empire, and if the Russians try to keep the territory, Austria might well go to war on the Ottoman side to keep the Russians from getting too powerful. From a security perspective, they would have little choice. And following that, under the terms of the Russo-Prussian alliance, Frederick would then be obligated to go to war to defend Russia. For once, Frederick the Great and Maria Theresa are able to agree on something. They don't want to fight each other again. So along with French mediators and a Russian Empress Catherine the Great, they come up with a solution. Russia only takes some small bits of territory from the Ottomans in modern-day Ukraine. Instead, Russia, Prussia, and Austria each agree to take a portion of Poland. This is a great power game designed to preserve the balance of power, and the Polish government at the time is basically a Russian puppet. So Poland doesn't even resist being turned into a small rump state. Russia gets some land in the east, Austria gets a big chunk of land in the south, and Prussia gets some land in the north that will connect East Prussia with Brandenburg, Silesia, and the rest of Frederick's land. Frederick himself has laid the groundwork to claim legitimacy in his new lands. While Poland is mostly Catholic at the time, around 10% of the population is either Protestant or Eastern Orthodox. Religious liberty has been a long-established right in Poland, but the Polish parliament has recently passed laws banning non-Catholics from running for office or working in the civil services. Frederick, who has always upheld religious liberty in his own lands, makes a lot of noise about this, and when he comes into these new territories, the propaganda is that he's protecting the rights of the local Protestants. Frederick is tired of war and does his best to stay out of conflict in the future. He almost gets sucked into war in 1778 when Maria Theresa's son, Emperor Joseph II, ignores his mother's warnings and invades the small state of Bavaria. But the French refuse to help the Austrians this time because they're busy helping the Americans in their war of independence, and the Russians threaten to come in and help Frederick push the Austrians out. And Maria Theresa goes behind her son's back and negotiates a peace agreement before there's more than some minor skirmishing. Being a Renaissance man, Frederick's achievements are not limited to the battlefield. He continues playing the flute for all of his life, and he writes more than a hundred sonatas, four complete symphonies, and a handful of operas. He doesn't rank among history's greatest composers, but he is genuinely talented, and some of his works are still performed today. Besides music, he also writes several philosophical treatises, including, in his younger years, a point-by-point rebuttal of Machiavelli's The Prince. He's in constant communication with Voltaire, and at one point gives asylum to Rousseau when he's on the run from the French authorities, although that has as much to do with needling the French as it does with any commitment to philosophical discourse. Frederick's commitment to religious freedom runs deep, and 
For him, it's not purely philosophical. He's engaged in a massive land reclamation project, and he needs people to fill the countryside. He's basically turning swamps into farmland, and this requires farmers. And sure enough, Prussia becomes a haven not just for Protestants from Austrian-ruled parts of Germany, but also for Jews. The Catholic population faces no discrimination and has no reason to leave. And Jesuit professors bring Europe's best education to Prussia's universities. Frederick the Great even authorizes the construction of a Catholic cathedral in Berlin, the first new Catholic church to be constructed in Prussia since the Reformation. Incidentally, the cathedral is designed by Frederick's chief architect, in accordance with sketches made by Frederick himself. Frederick would remain highly active until his final days, rising before dawn like a general on the campaign trail. In his last few years, he spends his time at the Palace of Sans Souci, which he had built for himself outside Berlin. With more and more of his human friends dying, he spends more time with his animals. He's always loved animals and famously refuses to wear spurs. And when somebody asks him why, he famously answers, try sticking a fork into your naked stomach and you will soon see why. So it's fitting that when Frederick dies in August of 1786 at the age of 74, his will states that he's to be buried without special honors in a simple grave on the palace grounds next to where he buried his beloved Italian greyhounds. But his nephew and heir, Frederick Wilhelm II, orders him to be buried next to his father, Frederick Wilhelm I, who he hated. So Frederick the Great will be buried at Potsdam Garrison Church until World War II. When the Allied bombing campaign intensifies in the middle of the war, the Nazis move the coffin into a salt mine to keep it safe, and it's eventually liberated by the Americans, and after the war it spends time in a couple of different places in Germany. But in 1991, less than a year after the post-Cold War reunification of West and East Germany, Frederick's coffin will once again be exhumed this time to lie in state at the Sans Souci Palace with a full military honor guard. After that, the guard will be dismissed, and the coffin, covered in a Prussian flag, would be lowered quietly into a grave near the graves of the Italian greyhounds, without honors, just as Frederick had requested. Maria Theresa's remaining career is dedicated to peace and the domestic development of her empire. Two major wars have shown the vulnerabilities of the Habsburg Empire, and she's decided that she needs to dedicate her reign to modernization if the empire is going to remain intact and not go into decline. As I already mentioned, she agrees to the partition of Poland in order to avoid conflict with the Russians. She's morally opposed to carving up Poland, but at the same time doesn't want to let Russia and Prussia get any advantage over her. This seems to amuse the more cynical Frederick, who famously says, She cries, but she takes. And as Maria Theresa and Frederick work with each other through years of non-warfare, they develop a sense of mutual respect. Another thing I already touched on was Maria Theresa's backdoor diplomacy with Frederick when Joseph II goes off to war in Bavaria. In his book, History of the Habsburg Empire, American historian John S. C. Abbott gives us a glimpse into this diplomacy. Along with her ambassador, Maria Theresa sends a personal letter to Frederick, reading, quote, I regret exceedingly that the King of Prussia and myself, in our advanced years, are about to tear the gray hairs from each other's heads, 
My age and my earnest desire to maintain peace are well known. My maternal heart is alarmed for the safety of my sons who are in the army. I take this step without the knowledge of my son, the emperor, and I entreat that you will not divulge it. I conjure you to unite your efforts with mine to reestablish harmony. End quote. Frederick sends the following reply along with the ambassador. Quote, Baron Thugu has delivered me your majesty's letter, and no one is or shall be acquainted with his arrival. It was worthy of your majesty to give such proofs of moderation after having so heroically maintained the inheritance of your ancestors. The tender attachment you display for your son the emperor and the princes of your blood deserves the applause of every heart, and augments, if possible, the high consideration I entertain for your majesty. I have added some articles to the propositions of Mr. Thugu, most of which have been allowed, and others which, I hope, will meet with little difficulty. He will immediately depart for Vienna, and will be able to return in five or six days, during which time I will act with such caution that your imperial majesty may have no cause of apprehension for the safety of any part of your family, and particularly of the emperor, whom I love and esteem, although our opinions differ in regard to the affairs of Germany." End quote. One of Maria Theresa's most ambitious projects is the abolition of serfdom. She's toured the countryside and spoken with many common farmers, and she's learned that conditions in many areas are worse than you'd think even when you think serfdom. Some landlords force their peasants to work seven days a week, and the peasants have to till their own fields at night in order to feed their families. Maria Theresa is able to replace this system in crown lands with a cash-rent system and strict rent controls. However, she faces resistance from others in the imperial court when she tries to extend the abolition to other lands, meaning lands owned by other nobles within her territories. In a rare occurrence, she is unable to persuade the court who side with Joseph II. Ironically, Joseph II will himself abolish serfdom in the entire empire just a few years after his mother's death. Maria Theresa is trying to set up a more modern civil service and military apparatus, which means she needs more educated people. So she sets up a system of secular public schools and mandates universal primary education. Predictably, this upsets many of the nobles who fear losing their advantage and privilege in the face of an educated populace. But it also upsets many peasants who want their children to stay home and help on the farm. Nonetheless, the children are sent to school, although in more rural areas it will take a few generations for education to truly be universal. To support this school system, Maria Theresa establishes a network of teaching colleges, and to support her army and civil service, she establishes both a military academy and a diplomatic university. She's also famously censorious. Under Maria Theresa's rule, thousands of books, plays, and other creative works are outlawed in Austria, either because they run counter to Catholic doctrine or because they're too bawdy for her tastes. This goes hand-in-hand hand with a bizarre obsession with sexual morality. She outlaws prostitution, same-sex relations, and even sex between people of different religions. And she establishes a police corps called the Chastity Commission with broad authority to conduct undercover investigations, raid private parties, and generally stop people from doing anything she considers naughty. Maria Theresa's focus on development and modernization extends also to the realms of justice and medicine. On the judicial front, she puts an end to witch trials, and late in her reign, she officially abolishes both torture and the death penalty. On the medical front, she establishes Austria's first medical university and maternity hospital. And in 1767, after a wave of smallpox sweeps the country, 
Maria Theresa has her diplomatic corps search far and wide for the latest inoculation methods. Then she establishes a free vaccine clinic in Vienna and has herself and two of her children vaccinated. In her case, as it turns out, the vaccination is not necessary. She had survived a bout of smallpox during the epidemic and is therefore immune. But the disease will leave her in poor health for the rest of her life. She suffers from chronic exhaustion and shortness of breath and has to push herself to the extreme to fulfill her duties. On the religious front, Maria Theresa's behavior is inconsistent. The only thing she seems to be consistent about is her desire to convert Protestants. Many are rounded up and sent into workhouses where the only way out of slave labor is to convert to Catholicism. Those who later revert to Protestantism after being released are often exiled. On the face of it, she is a hardcore Roman Catholic, and she ensures that only Catholic individuals can serve in public office. But she also fears that the church might undermine her monarchical powers. She expels the Jesuits from Austria due to what she views as their undue influence. And when Pope Clement XIV suppresses the order in 1773, she seizes all Jesuit-owned lands for herself. Ironically, due to Frederick the Great's religious freedom policies, many of the expelled Austrian Jesuits emigrate to Prussia and continue as teachers. There are also many Eastern Orthodox subjects in the empire's Balkan provinces. Since these provinces are on the Ottoman frontier and are vital for military defense, the Orthodox subjects receive complete freedom of religion and special privileges to run their own affairs. Maria Theresa's treatment of Jews is the most inconsistent of all. During the first half of her reign, she is openly anti-Semitic, which unfortunately is not all that uncommon at the time. At one point she writes, quote, I know of no greater plague than this race, which, on account of its deceit, usury, and avarice, is driving my subjects into beggary. Therefore, as far as possible, the Jews are to be kept away and avoided. End quote. But later in her reign, Maria Theresa hires a Jewish finance minister, bans the forcible baptism of Jewish children, and releases Jews from the obligation to pay their local church tax. So, it seems as if something changes her mind, but history does not tell us what. No discussion of Maria Theresa's life would be complete without talking about her children. Unlike Frederick, who dies childless, Maria Theresa has a whopping 16 kids. Seven die before reaching adulthood, and the rest are disposed of in various marriage alliances. This is a little bit odd, since Maria Theresa married for love and rules an empire, you'd think she'd be some kind of proto-feminist, but she marries all of her daughters off for strategic regions. The only exception is her daughter, Maria Elizabeth, who was supposed to marry French King Louis XV, who recently became widowed. But when Maria Elizabeth survives a run of smallpox, her face is left horribly scarred, and Maria Theresa sends her off to a convent. Two of her sons, Joseph II and Leopold II, would become Holy Roman Emperor. Another becomes Archbishop Elector of Cologne. Daughter Maria Carolina marries King Ferdinand IV of Naples and Sicily. And perhaps the most famous daughter of all, Maria Antonia, marries Louis XVI of France and becomes known to history by her French name, Marie Antoinette. On November 24, 1780, Maria Theresa collapses and has to be brought to her bed. Two days later, she receives the last rites. But she continues to meet with her ministers and run the empire. On the night of November 28, she's speaking with her son Joseph, the emperor. 
and she's obviously struggling to stay awake. He asks her if she wants to sleep, and she supposedly says, In a few hours I shall appear before the judgment seat of God, and you would have me lose my time in sleep? Maria Teresa dies the next day, November 29, 1780, at the age of 64, surrounded by several of her children. And when he receives word of her death, Frederick the Great is supposedly saddened, saying that he never saw her as an enemy, but as a respected rival. Frederick the Great and Maria Theresa intrigue me because they're both a kind of person that we today would consider a paradox. On the one hand, they're autocrats playing the game of empire. On the other hand, they're both true Enlightenment figures who believe that it's their duty to promote the welfare of their people. Both will reform and modernize their realms, so when autocratic France goes all revolutionary in a few decades, Austria and Prussia don't. When it comes to government, at least, France is still stuck in the old pre-Enlightenment past. Now that we've talked about the two most significant individuals in our story and everything that's happened in Europe, let's get down to the nitty-gritty. What has changed around the world for the great colonial powers, and how is that going to impact the future? In the long term, at least from a geopolitical perspective, the most significant changes are probably in India. A couple episodes back, we talked about Robert Clive and the East India Company completely dominating the French on the Indian subcontinent. It's worth noting that the French get to keep some trading ports in the Treaty of Paris, but none of them are allowed to be fortified, which allows for the eventual British rule over all of India. There is enough here for several episodes, and I hate to give this story short shrift, but broadly speaking... Robert Clive and others back a local governor named Mir Jafar who has helped them drive out the French. And as the British trade company grows in power, so does Mir Jafar. And as the governor or Nawab of Bengal, one of India's wealthiest regions, he becomes insanely powerful. This is a mutually beneficial partnership. Now, the region of Bengal at the time is nominally part of the Mughal Empire. The Mughal Empire is an old empire that dates back to the 1500s and has at times ruled all of the Indian subcontinent. But like all empires do, at some point it's fallen on hard times. The Mughal Empire has always been fairly tenuous, with a Muslim elite ruling over a region that's mostly Hindu majority with a large Sikh minority. And now the Mughal Empire is in the middle of a civil war with multiple local rebellions and breakaway regions, and the imperial family is desperate to regain control of as much land as possible. Ideally, that will mean the wealthier regions and the crown prince Ali Gohar has just reconquered the nearby provinces of Bihar and Orissa. So he sets his sights on Bengal, and the British and the East India Company send troops to assist Mir Jafar. In 1761, the troops of the British East India Company and Mir Jafar meet the troops of Ali Gohar, who have with them a few of the remaining French soldiers in India. The problem the imperial troops have is the same problem they face a lot during this era, poor morale. You have mostly Hindu soldiers being led by Muslim commanders and asked to kill other Hindus. They have no reason to fight to begin with, and they have more in common with their supposed enemies than with their commanders. So when they get into battle, all too often, they turn and run. That's what happens when they meet Mir Jafar's troops and the East India Company, although they get a little help. In his book, The Anarchy, The East India Company, Corporate Violence, and the Pillage of an Empire, 
Scottish historian William Dalrymple writes of the Crown Prince's meeting with his French military advisor, Jean Law, directly before the battle, and carries us through to the aftermath. Dalrymple writes, quote, The night before the battle, Law dined for the first time with the Emperor. A private affair, the atmosphere was very relaxed, and there were none of the usual constraints of etiquette and ceremony. I told him that our situation was very bad. The prince then opened up his heart about the misfortunes that had continued to dog him, and I tried to persuade him that, for the sake of his own security and peace, it might be better if he turned his gaze in some direction other than Bengal. Alas, he said, what will they say if I retreat? Contempt will be added to the indifference with which my subjects already regard me. Early the following morning, the company troops took the initiative, moving rapidly forward from their entrenchments, cannonading as they marched. A well-aimed ball from a twelve-pounder killed the mahout of the emperor's elephant. Another stray shot wounded the elephant itself, which careered off the field carrying the emperor with it. Meanwhile, Mir Jafar, reverting to his usual devious tactics, had managed with large bribes to corrupt Shah Alam's commander, Kamgar Khan, as well as several other courtiers in his retinue, who soon crossed sides and joined forces of the Nawab. After that, there could be no doubt about the outcome. The general and the courtiers all took to their heels, taking with them the greater part of the Mughal army. Monsieur Law de Lortzen, who was in charge of the royal artillery, in spite of his bravery, military skill, and all his efforts, could do nothing to stop them, and the French officer was taken prisoner. Ghulam Hussein Khan gives a moving account of Law's brave last stand and his determination, having seen the emperor deserted by all and betrayed even by his commander-in-chief, to battle to the death. Monsieur Law, with a small force and the few pieces of artillery that he could muster, bravely fought the English, and for some time he managed to withstand their immense numerical superiority. The handful of troops that followed Monsieur Law, discouraged by the flight of the Emperor and tired of the wandering life they had hitherto led in his service, turned about and fled. Monsieur Law, finding himself abandoned and alone, resolved not to turn his back. He bestrode one of the guns and remained firm in that posture, waiting for the moment of death. Moved by Law's bravery, the company commander, John Karnak, dismounted, and without taking a guard, but bringing his most senior staff officers, walked over on foot, and pulling their hats from their heads, they swept the air with them, as if to make him a salam, pleading with Law to surrender. You have done everything that can be expected from a brave man, and your name shall undoubtedly be transmitted to posterity by the pen of history, he begged. Now loosen your sword from your loins, come amongst us, and abandon all thoughts of contending with the English. Law answered that if they would accept his surrendering himself just as he was, he had no objections, but that as to surrendering himself with the disgrace of his being without a sword, it was a shame he would never submit to, and that they must take his life if they were not satisfied with the condition. The English commanders, admiring his firmness, consented to his surrendering himself in the manner he wished to, after which the major shook hands with him in their European manner, and every sentiment of enmity was instantly dismissed from both sides. Later in the company camp, the historian was appalled by the boorishness of Mir Jafar's Murdishabad soldiers who began to taunt the captured law, asking, Where is the Bibi, mistress, law now? Karnak was furious at the impropriety of the remark. This man, he said, had fought bravely and deserves the attention of all brave men. The impertinences which you have been offering him may be customary amongst your friends in your nation, but cannot be suffered in ours, for whom it is a standing rule never to offer injury to a vanquished foe. The man whom had taunted law, checked by this reprimand, held his tongue and did not answer a word. He went away much abashed, and although he was a commander of importance, no one spoke to him any more, or made a show of standing up at his departure. 
The incident caused Ghulam Hussein Khan to pay a rare compliment to the British, a nation he regarded as having wrecked his motherland. This reprimand did much honor to the English, and it must be acknowledged to the honor of these strangers that their conduct in war and battle is worthy of admiration, just as, on the other hand, nothing is more becoming than their behavior to an enemy, whether in the heat of action or in the pride of success and victory. End quote. Now, the war of the East India Company against the Mughal Empire will continue beyond the Seven Years' War and will not conclude until 1765. And like I said, I'm not going to give a blow-by-blow -blow account of the Bengal War, but I wanted to talk about this account because it's illustrative. It helps to understand how the British Empire are able to conquer a whole subcontinent. Think back to all the European battles and all the bloodshed we've talked about in the past few episodes. Knowing all that, we come to India and we find that many of the Bengal soldiers are impressed with how the British conduct themselves. Depending on how you want to think of it, it's less brutal or more civilized than the warfare they've seen. This sums up the British conquest of Bengal in a nutshell, and... I'm about to put my foot in my mouth here and offend everybody. Imagine you are a Polish person in Warsaw in 1945, and you see the Soviet tanks come in to drive out the Nazis. You know full well that you're exchanging Nazi rule for Soviet rule, but at the time, after what you've been through, it looks like a great idea. Now, I'm not saying that the Mughals were Nazis or that the British Empire was the Soviet Union, but I'm saying that from the perspective of the average Hindu or Sikh on the ground, they're not being colonized. They're exchanging one imperial master for another, but the new master is on the other side of the world and is primarily interested in tea. It's only later on when the British colonial policies force deindustrialization and mass poverty that British rule begins to look much less beneficial. Anyway, after saying all that about the British getting Bengal from the Mughals, that's not technically what happens. In 1765, the British East India Company, not Great Britain, signs a treaty with the Mughals called the Treaty of Allahabad. In this treaty, the East India Company gains Diwani rights in the province of Bengal Bihar Orissa, which means that they have the right to collect taxes directly from the people. A portion of these taxes go to the Mughal emperor, but the company gets to keep the bulk, along with the right to build factories and establish trade. Ironically, Mir Jafar gets nothing out of this deal. He dies shortly before the treaty is signed, and while his heirs remain nominal governors of the province, they rely on the East India Company for an annual stipend. And while they officially retain the right to make treaties, their foreign policy is de facto dictated by British interests. This establishes a major base of British power in East India. And as the Mughal Empire continues to weaken, Britain will slowly gain more control of more areas all over the subcontinent, and it will ultimately culminate in the formal establishment of the British Raj in 1858. While the British conquest of much of India is going to have tremendous long-term results. The biggest immediate effects of the Seven Years' War will be felt in North America. Here's where things get a little bit janky, because not only do the British get to keep French Canada, but they also get to take Florida from the Spanish, and the Spanish are compensated by receiving Louisiana from the French and the French and Spanish both regain their valuable Caribbean islands from the British. The French also return Menorca, a Mediterranean island that they had taken from the British during the war, 
in exchange for a couple of small islands off the Canadian coast that establish French fishing rights. And believe it or not, the tiny islands of Saint-Pierre and Miquelon remain a French overseas territory to this day. As for the Iroquois, the British make a separate treaty with them. Parliament guarantees the Iroquois full rights to the land south of the Great Lakes and west of the Appalachians. This means that, at least for a few years, if you were to look at a map drawn in Britain, it would show the Iroquois nation as a recognized country, just like France or Spain or any other country. This keeps the British and Iroquois at peace, and furthermore creates a wide buffer zone between British North America and Spanish Louisiana. That said, the British conduct no treaties with the French-allied Native Americans from north of the Great Lakes. Instead, these tribes are now living in British territory and must either leave or conduct themselves as British subjects. This means the end of the friendlier French version of North American colonization. The French settlers and Native Americans have generally gotten along very well. Their societies are partially integrated. Look no further than the Acadians, who are mixed Native and European. The colonial government, at least until very recently, has done a good job of respecting tribal traditions and customs. One of my favorite artworks of the period shows the French colonial governor, Louis de Baud de Frontenac, performing a war dance with his native allies. It's in the public domain, and I'll link it in the description because it speaks to me. It's not just a depiction of a historical event. It's a depiction of a unique society and tradition that disappeared overnight at the end of the Seven Years' War. It's interesting to think of what could have happened. What might have been if the French had won a few key battles in Hanover and retained their North American colonies, or even gained some of the British ones? In this hypothetical timeline, would Europeans ever have settled North America in the same way they did in ours? Or would there have been more of a fusion of different cultures? I don't mean to whitewash all of French colonial history here, but what existed in French Canada for a time was something special, both for the French and for their native allies. It also does not help circumstances that British Governor Jeffrey Amherst stops giving gifts to the natives. Giving gifts is a part of native diplomacy, but Amherst calls it appeasement and even puts limits on the trade of firearms to Native Americans. This leads to a native uprising even before the Treaty of Paris is signed. Less than a month before the signing, in late April of 1763, a coalition of nine Native American tribes, led by an Ottawa chief named Pontiac, begin a war against the British. They're spurred on by French traders and stragglers from the French armies who tell the natives that the French have already won the war in Europe and that a great fleet is already on its way with thousands of French soldiers. This war, called... Pontiac's War will last until July of 1766, when it becomes abundantly clear that no French troops are on their way to save the day, most of the Native Americans will grudgingly accept British overlordship, although they will be allowed to keep their traditional customs. Those who are unwilling to accept this go into exile further west or south in the American Great Plains. As I mentioned, the British relationship with the Iroquois is a bit different than their relationship with the other tribes and confederations. 
The border established in 1763, called the Proclamation Line of 1763, is a symbol of peace between the two cultures. In theory, it should mean a lasting peace, but there's a complicating factor. The American colonists. See, like most Indian treaties of the era, the treaty is verbal, and it simply states that the Iroquois control the watershed west of the Appalachian Mountains and the British own the eastern watersheds. But because the treaty is verbal, there's no actual land survey with official border markers, and conflicts arise. The natives have their own traditional boundaries between the watersheds, but British-American colonists often have different interpretations. This leads to border clashes because the headwaters of various rivers hold a special meaning in Iroquois religion, and because the border is at the edge of a watershed, colonists are almost invariably encroaching on sacred land. And when there are disputes, the British administration more often than not tends to side with the natives to preserve the peace. But this situation pleases nobody. On the one hand, the colonists perceive their own government as acting against their best interests. Imagine you're a farmer on the frontier, and you settle in what you think is 100% British land. Then the natives ask you to leave, you don't, and they complain to the local governor who forces you to leave. You might have been wrong about where you built your farm, but you'd probably still be upset at your government for deciding against you. On the other hand, the Iroquois also have reason to be displeased. For one thing, the British established Fort Pitt in the location of modern-day Pittsburgh. The official line is that it's necessary to protect inland trade routes, but the Iroquois question why the British are building a fort that's west of the proclamation line and defends against nobody but the Iroquois. For another thing, British diplomats, including Chief Big Business, Sir William Johnson, well, they're pushing for the establishment of a formal written treaty and a proper border survey. This is probably a good idea in retrospect. It's something British authorities could point to to keep their colonists firmly on their side of the border. But the Iroquois have no tradition of border markers or of detailed written contracts. To them, it sounds like the British are trying to renege on the existing agreement and cheat them. All of this lays part of the groundwork for an event you may have heard of, the American Revolution. The Seven Years' War is the first true world war between most of the world's major powers. Between laying the groundwork for the American Revolution and the British dominance of India, as well as the solidification of Prussia as a world power, it triggers a series of world-shaking events. Without the Seven Years' War, we might not have a United States or a democratic India. You might have a central Europe dominated by an enlarged Austrian empire. Instead, the original World War gave us the world we have today. And that's why it's relevant. Hello again. It's me, Dan. This is a friendly reminder that if you're only listening to the audio podcast, you're not getting all of my content. I also have a Patreon channel called Dan's War College. Each month, I break down a historical battle, weapon, or tactic and explain how it works. This is a video series with maps, graphics, and other helpful visual aids, and you can get it all for just $5 a month. We've done 10 episodes so far, 
and some of these have even been patron requests, because I do take requests. You can find the link to the Patreon channel in the episode description. And if you're on the fence, episode 5 of Dan's War College is currently publicly available, so you can check that one out and get a taste for what the channel is like. Of course, not everybody wants to spend $5 a month for a monthly video, and who can blame you? There are so many channels and subscription services out there that it's just impossible to sign up for all of them. But if you still want to support the show, you can share it with your friends or post a link on social media. Shows like this grow by word of mouth. And if the channel's growth is any indication, you guys are great advertisers. Thanks so much, and please keep it up. And if your podcast service lets you leave a review, please do so. If you want to follow Relevant History on social media, you can find links in the description for that as well. Or just go to Twitter and find at Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, Podcast. If you want to send me an email, you can write to dantollerpodcast at gmail.com. That's Dan, T-O-L-E-R, Podcast at gmail.com. Tell me what you liked, or if you think I got something wrong, tell me that too. You can also visit the show's website at dantollerpodcast.com. Once again, that's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.